Go to Genesis 29. Did I already tell you that? Genesis chapter 29. I'm going to preach uh, a little while tonight and hopefully a bit of blessing to you. Uh, Genesis chapter 29 and start reading in verse number 21. The Bible said, And Jacob said unto Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go in unto her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought, him to him, brought her to him, and he went into her. Now, that's not the situation. The situation was, is that Jacob loved Rachel. And he worked seven years for Rachel. Now, he's in, at the end of seven years, and he's expecting Rachel's daddy, Laban, to give him Rachel. But that's not what he does. He sneaks in Rachel's sister, Leah, who's the older sister, and he sneaks her in there. Of course, it's dark at night, and he couldn't tell and all this stuff. But anyway, he wakes up in the morning and realizes it's not Rachel, it's Leah. Now, he says this. Um, the Bible said in verse 17, he said, Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was be uh, beautiful and well-favored. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. Now, that's what he does. He serves seven years for Rachel, but he doesn't get Rachel. And then he says in verse uh, uh, 23, he said, and it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to him and went in unto her and Laban gave unto his daughter Leah Zilpah his maid uh, for a handmaid and it came to pass that in the morning behold it was Leah and he said to Laban what is this that thou hast done to me did not I serve thee for Rachel serve with thee for Rachel wherefore then hast thou beguiled me and Laban said it must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn Fulfill her week, and we will give thee this also for the service which thou shalt serve with me yet another seven years, yet seven other years. Now, what it was is Laban, he's a character. He's a conniver. He knows how to work a situation. And what he does, he takes Leah and gives Leah to Jacob, and Jacob spends the night with her. Therefore, they are married. And he gets up the next morning, and he realizes that he's married, and there's nothing he can do about it. So Laban says, all right, I, I know I kind of did you wrong here. He said, but you, if you'll serve with me another seven years, I'll give you Rachel. Now that seemed like a harsh thing. He serves a week and he gets Rachel, but he has to still go on and serve out these seven years. Now he says this in verse 31. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Now look at verse chapter 30 and verse 1. And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children or else I die. And that's the verse I want to get you to look at. Give me children. Give me children or else I die. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just pray now, God, you'll take this message and use it. Edify your saints, God. Help us. Burden our hearts about lost folk. Burden, us, burden our hearts and help us to realize that if we don't get out here and try to win them, God, nobody will. And Father, I just pray now that you bless this message in Jesus Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Now, Jacob's on the run. Jacob's on the run from Esau. If you remember over there, Esau uh, was Jacob's twin brother. And what happens is that Esau is a man of the world. He's a He's an outdoorsman, you know, he's a real tough and rugged guy, and he doesn't care for much things spiritual. Jacob is kind of the opposite. Jacob really doesn't care for the things spiritual, but Jacob's an in, indoor man. He likes it inside and all this stuff. But through his conniving and through his treachery, he steals the blessing and the birthright from Esau. And he gets it, and he does it treacherously, and he ends up with it, and he's so... A angry, Esau is so angry that he goes after Jacob and his mother sends him away to her brother Laban. And he goes to Laban and, you, and we just read the story there. He served seven years for Rachel or what he thought was Rachel. And he finds out that he didn't get Rachel, he got Leah. So he agrees to serve seven more years for uh, Rachel. And uh, he only works a week and then he gets Rachel. 
but he has to stay with him seven more years. So what happens in the, in the passing of time, what you see here is that God opened up Leah's womb, and he opened up Zilpah's womb, and she began to have children. And Rachel looks, and she sees all these kids running around here, and she can't have any children. And she looks over there, and she looks at Jacob, and she said, give me children, else I die. That's a pretty heavy load to put on a fellow. Give me children, else I die. Rachel was a young girl, and she's from the homeland of Abraham. And Rachel's, uh, Rachel is the daughter of Laban, and that's Isaac's wife's Rebekah's brother. She's the son of Bethuel, or he's the son of Bethuel, and that's Abraham's nephew. Laban is Abraham's nephew. Therefore, that makes Rachel Jacob's first cousin. Did you get all that? That's why the Lord says don't mess with genealogies. But you have this thing, and, and what he's done, he's married his, his cousin. And, you know, that doesn't go over too well today, but back in the day, it was uh, done quite a bit. But I want you to notice Rachel's plight. Look at verse 31. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened up her womb, but Rachel was barren. Rachel was barren. You know, that's a, that's a terrible thing for a woman, especially if she loves children and she wants children. She's, her plight is not uncommon in the Bible. You have Sarah over there in Genesis chapter 11. She was barren for a while. You have Manoah's wife over there in Judges 13. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, you have Hannah who was barren. In Luke chapter 1, you have Elizabeth. She was barren. So it's not that uncommon. Sometimes God would shut up the room, womb for a reason. And he wouldn't let them have children for a reason. But Rachel wanted children. She told Jacob, give me children, else I die. You know, a barren woman, for the most part, is an unhappy woman. In fact, you read your Bible over there in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 15 and 16. The Bible says, the horse leaf hath two daughters, crying, give, give. There are three things that are never satisfied, yea, four things that say not, it is enough. The grave and the barren womb. He calls that out number two. The grave and the barren womb. Now, the, the Lord says a woman that's barren is an unhappy woman. And the reason for that is, is what children bring to a, to a home. A home becomes a family with children. Life becomes more than just centered around you. Once you start having kids, and you folks know, you have kids, you folks know that uh, once you start having children, it's all about them. It's no longer about you. It's about the kids. It's about the grandkids. When my kids grew up, you know, I thought, you know, got that over with. Glad I got that done. And they're raised and they're gone. And then all of a sudden, here they started bringing in grandchildren. And now I've got more responsibility than I had before. I spend much more money than I did before. But one thing I can do with my grandchildren that I couldn't do with my children, I can spoil them, I can make them rotten, then I can get up and say, well, I've got to go home and leave mom and daddy with it. The fascination of watching a child grow, isn't that something? Uh, we have a, a young lady in our church, she just had a child, and it's the smallest baby I ever saw. Just a, she's a real small little girl anyway. I don't think she weighs 100 pounds. She brought this little baby home from the hospital, and that thing wasn't that big. The tiniest little kid I ever saw. But now, this is just two, three months later, that little kid is a little chunk, and he's grown, and it's amazing to watch these little kids grow. And I'll tell you something else I can give you from experience. It's, it's exciting. It's, it makes you feel good when you see your children successful. Amen. To watch them grow and make their own way and, and do all these things. It's a blessing. It's a blessing. But at times you do wonder. At time, do you realize that science says that at the age of four, a child has learned half of the intelligence that he will have in maturity? At the age of four. That explains a lot. <laughs> the major cause of death with children, death in children, is accidents. Accidents. I remember Derek, my son, when he was just uh, two or three years old, 
he got sick, he got pneumonia. We didn't know he had pneumonia, but he got sick and uh, was having trouble breathing and his temperature was high. And uh, We put him in my, my daughter's crib and we put a blanket over the crib and we ran a humidifier into that thing and thought we were helping that kid, but what I was doing, I was killing him because he had double pneumonia and all that, that moisture was coming in and it was, it was killing him. And it's just the grace of God that kept me from killing that boy. But the accidents. I remember my little girl, we had a porch set up about that high on one end. I remember me and my son were playing some ball and all of a sudden I heard this big crash and I looked up there and my daughter, my daughter was hanging off the porch, just barely hanging. I'm about to drop about six or seven feet there and I ran over there and grabbed her and I thought, you know, she could have been gone right there. One time when I was a little boy, my mama let me ride. We, she was going to take her sisters-in-law to high school, and I never will forget, and we were in this Chevrolet. And we got there, and we dumped off the girls, and we pulled off, and I was sitting up on the window there on the passenger side, and I was waving and waving. All of a sudden, that door came open, and we were going, you know, 10, 15 miles an hour. And the door just swung open and me on it and I'm hanging on it and begging my mom to stop, begging her. And she was trying to slow down and I was wanting her to stop. Uh, she hurt my feelings that day because she wouldn't stop. She was slowing down and it just scared me to death. But I could have been dead there. I remember one time when me and my cousins, uh, one winter day, we got out. But they lived down by the lake and it was about six or seven of us and it had been snowing and all this stuff and we walked out on that, that ice and we went out there in the middle of the lake and instead of turning around and come back, we just went on. Well, my cousin's dad, he followed us, he's trying to find us and he saw these tracks going out into the middle of the lake and he didn't see any coming back. And finally he did find us and when he found us, he was just crying and bawling and scared to death that we had fallen in and that uh, we couldn't get out of there and all that stuff. You know, sometimes kids are a heartache. They're a heartache. Sometimes kids need a smack. Yes, sir. Amen. Sometimes they need a smack. You know, a fellow said one time, he said, everything in the home is now run by a flick of the switch. So why not the kids? Yeah. In 1975, the Supreme Court ruled that kids couldn't be paddled without the permission of the parents. That's when the teachers started getting whipped. Yeah. That's right. A fellow by the name of Homer Phillips said this. He said, the time to start correcting your children is before they start correcting you. Amen. The Duke of Wellington said this about America. He said, the thing that impresses me most about America is the way the parents obey their children. Isn't that true? Yep. Fella come walking through the mall the other day and this, this other guy was talking to this lady and uh, the guy was kind of famous and she wanted... Uh, that famous guy to give her grandson or her son a uh, an autograph. So the guy agreed to stand there until she'd get the boy over there and she called out to the boy and she said, come here, come here. And that guy said that the little boy turned around and said, shut up, mother. And that rich man said, or that famous guy said, I just came that close to going over there and grabbing him by the nap of the neck. and." and taking things in hand, but she just smiled and let it go. One time I was sitting at the house and we had people over and there's a little boy, he's three or four years old. And they were playing uh, with my kids on the floor and they were getting ready to go and both the mom and dad said, come on, Justin, come on, let's go. It's time to go. And that little boy turned around and I was standing there and he turned around and he looked like a demon. And he says, leave me alone. And before I could catch myself, I already started over there after him. But they were from California, so they weren't going to do anything. Yeah. Yeah. Children. I love them. I love kids. I love to watch kids. But you know, children are like wild asses coats. They need to be broke. Yeah. They need to learn. They need to grow. But anyway, Rachel says, give me children, else I die. You know, that's the plea of a bride to her husband. Give me children, else I die. Can I say, first of all, that it's the most natural response? Amen. 
It's the most natural thing for a woman to want children. Now, you may be in here tonight and you may not have children. You may not have ever wanted to have children. That's completely up to you, but I can tell you this. A desire for a woman to have a child is a very natural response. God has placed it in his creation to desire to propagate its species, to reproduce itself. That's just something God put in creation. Plants reproduce. Animals reproduce. Mankind reproduces. Something that is unnatural cannot reproduce. Sodomites. You say, don't be talking like that. Listen, they're not natural. They're perverted. They're not real. They're, they're ungodly. They cannot reproduce. They recruit. You say, oh, preacher, I don't want to hear that. Well, you better watch your kids. You better watch your kids. The Bible said in Genesis 124, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and the beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. That's the way God does it. It's a most natural response. Give me children, she says. She didn't say give me a mansion. She didn't say give me gold, give me fame. She said give me children. That's a natural response of any mother. Give me children. It gives you a feeling of completeness. When you start having kids, you feel complete. The Bible said in Psalm 127, he said, Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows in the hand of a mighty man, so are the children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. And they shall not be ashamed, and they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. It gives a feeling, when you start having kids, it gives a feeling of completeness. It's like you've done your job. You've done what you're supposed to do. You've brought a child into the world. It's a blessing. It gives a feeling of contribution. He says, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. It's a feeling of contribution. You've contributed to society when you begin to have children. Now, not everybody can have children. I had an older couple in my church. Uh, they couldn't have children. So on Mother's Day, we'd make a big deal of it. You know, we'd say she's all of our mother, you know, and we'd, we'd give her this stuff. She so desired to have children, but she couldn't have them. It's a natural thing for a woman to want to have children. And I'll tell you something else. Children do. They give you comfort in your old age. As I get older, my grandkids especially, uh, give me comfort. They're a blessing in my heart. So when Rachel says, give me children, it's the most natural thing. Then it says, I want to say this, it's the most natural response, but it also it's the most necessary response. She said, give me children, else I die. That's pretty drastic. Give me children or I'm going to die. My, what a thing to say there in verse 1 of chapter 30. Families. Dr. Ruckman said this when I was in school down there, and I never will forget it. But he said this, he said, families are not properly families without children. That's what he said. And I believe he's true. Ephesians 6 deals with a man and his wife and their children. Failure to have children means failure of a name. You know, a lot of people can't have children and their name ceases right there. It's not their fault in some cases. It's just the way it is. They can't have children. But a failure to have a child means there's a failure of the name to continue. It's the reason that God raises, uh, makes the brothers of, of, of uh, other men raise children in honor to the departed brethren. The future will end without children. She says, give me children, else I die. Folk, do you realize that if we don't win folks to Christ or try to win folks to Christ, that we will cease to exist? I see a lot of these churches, and Brother Dennis and I have talked about this at some length, but I can tell you right now, I've seen churches come into a place and they'll start this church, and before you know it, it's running big numbers and all this stuff. What are they doing? Are they winning souls? Most of the time, no. They're just stealing sheep. They come into an area and they start getting people out of other churches and they build their church that way. That's not the New Testament way of building a church. The New Testament way of building a church is soul winning. Give me children, else I die. 
Any family or organization will die if it does not reproduce itself. The third thing I want to say, it's the most neglected responsibility. She said, give me children, else I die. And then you know what, you know what uh, Jacob says? He says, am I in God's stead? You know, don't put the wrap on me. Don't put it on me. But God does. He places it on us. Give me children else I die. God puts it on us. It's our responsibility. And it is the most neglected responsibility. He says over there in 2 Corinthians 5.20, he says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. That's our job. You and I are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. It's our job to talk to other people, to try to get them saved. Oh, we want to see them saved so they can go to heaven and not go to hell. But another reason you should want to win souls, or at least want to try to win souls, is because it's your responsibility. Amen. It's our job. And God has decided that's the way he wanted to do it, and that's the way we do it. There's no other way, as I said, to propagate a church than soul winning uh, through witnessing. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians 1.21, he said, For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, for it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Mark 16.15, he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Acts 2 verse 47 says, Praising God and having favor with all people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. You know what God wants to do? He wants to give you children. Amen. Would to God that we could get the attitude that Rachel had. Yep. Give me children, else I die. Give me children, else I die. I'm not talking about lifestyle evangelism. I'm not talking about just living a certain way so people can see Christ in you. That's a bunch of bunk. Amen. You know, God called us to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Just because you live right, you act right, and you do right, that doesn't mean you're saved. Amen. Nobody can hear the gospel that way. They need to know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, that they're sinners and that there's a price on sin and God in heaven paid the price himself if they'll but trust him. But they'll never hear it if you neglect your responsibility. You'll never hear it. Next to the word of God, the dearest thing to God Almighty is the souls of men. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Do you realize that if you're going to find the love of God, the only place you can find it is at Calvary? Amen. You can't find the love of God anywhere else but Calvary. Right. God loved the world at Calvary. You know what he said over there about people that don't want to come to Calvary? He said he hates them. He said that over there in the book of Psalms. He said it in other places. But God hates all workers of iniquity. He doesn't just hate their sin. He hates them. You say, well, how can they find the love of God? They've got to go to Calvary. Amen. And they'll never go to Calvary if you neglect your responsibility. Amen. God gave his son, and God saved sinners because of his son. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. The reason Jesus Christ came that first time was one. The main reason was he came to save sinners.